This episode, I met with Glenn Hager, the comptroller of the state of Texas. Um, we hit on the uh, the state surplus, uh, just the overall economic outlook uh, of the state, job numbers that just came out, uh, put Texas on uh, the top of, of every state uh, in the United States. We talked about the Broadband uh, Development Office and the initiatives that he's rolling out statewide. We talked about the energy plan and the reliability of the of the grid. We talked about economic development and uh, the new program that replaced Chapter 313 and a number of different things I think you'll find very helpful as a business owner. So uh, enjoy the episode. You know, the job numbers just came out and record right. numbers for the state. Um, yeah, absolutely. You tell, know, us, pretty- tell us about it. Yeah, pretty phenomenal in Texas, you know, and we've known that for year after year after year, Texas has been growing the amount of number of the people that are moving to the state of Texas, whether it's the number of businesses that are relocating, new expansions, new projects, small business growth in the state of Texas, but really the job numbers just just pops out. You know, the fact is we created more jobs in Texas in the last year than any other state in the nation. So number one in job creation in the top five far as percentage of jobs that were created. So really phenomenal, strong growth in Texas overall. And obviously people have talked and been concerned about the economy with record high inflation, a lot of other barriers, some some issues globally, economically, as well as concerns in the commercial real estate market because of higher interest rates. And as those loans roll over, what is that going to do here in Texas? And one of the points that, that we continue to make is that at least as a foundation, the state of Texas compared to other states and compared to many countries around the world, the foundation is really no stronger than where? right here in Texas. Right, right. And, uh, you know, we've we've led month after month over the last several years. But the um, talk a little bit about the future, because, like you said, people are concerned about the future and the economy. uh, But Texas seems to not worry anyone and, and not what I'm seeing. Yeah. You know, whether you're wherever you're at across the state of Texas is is pretty amazing. Used to you know, a decade ago, even five years ago, we'd hear a lot of a lot of talk about how there was growth in whether it's the large metropolitan areas, whether it's where I'm at here, you know, in Austin or whether the Houston Metroplex, the Dallas Metroplex, San Antonio. But when you get further beyond that to other regions of the state of Texas, you didn't hear about the same growth opportunities, the number of businesses that were, would locate or expansions. But as I travel the state, that growth is occurring in other parts of the state of Texas. And so really that economic opportunity has expanded to greater parts of the state of Texas, which I think really kind of sends the strong signal that Texas economically is more diverse industry-wise, is much more diverse in the growth across the 12 economic regions, which is really important because one of the points that I've made over the years is I felt like we've done a good job in economic development, economic growth as a state, but we needed to do a better job to have that opportunity across the various regions of the state of Texas. And so, you know, no matter who I'm talking to across the state, people feel pretty positive despite some of the federal regulations, despite despite some of the, uh, you know, lack of ability in D.C. to get certain things done. People feel good about being in Texas and, and the future looks really bright for the next 10, 15, 20 years. And, and, and I'll just say this, you know, just to kind of make a point. We don't know. No one knows exactly when the next large national global recession is going to happen. It will happen at some point in time. And obviously that will impact Texas, just like it will impact the rest of the world. However, I continue to make the point. I'd rather do my job here that do my job somewhere else because the foundation is really strong in Texas. Well, and I think, um, you know, when you look at the job numbers, the diversity, like you said, whether it's retail, yeah, manufacturing, yeah. financial services, I mean, right. controller, right. the, the right. financial services companies that are looking at this state, I mean, we're competing with the East Coast. Yeah, I've, 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 I've asked people in uh, the last couple of nights at a few different events I've been at, and I've asked people, you know, here and there as we're talking about economic opportunities in Texas and maybe their their industry sector uh, in particular. And, and, and I like to ask who said, name me what industry sector contributes the largest percent of our GDP. And, and they all kind of look at each other. OK, that may be a trick question. And, and, you know, they start you can see their kind of mind. I saw somebody the other day and I said, well, I know you're going to mention oil and gas. I can see it. 
Um, it is a really important piece of the state economy, has been for a long time, will continue to be an important piece of the economy. But if that's your guess, I'd suggest you go on a different one. And so it's kind of funny because my point being is nobody necessarily thinks the financial sector is 17% of our GDP and continues to grow, which as we, you know, as we know is the banking, the insurance, the real estate sector, that is just, that's pretty hard to imagine that it has grown. And so you see a lot of companies coming to Texas from that sector that did not have headquarters here. And so uh, that's, that's important for the diversity of the state important for the diversity of different regions of the state, whether it's the Metroplex, whether it's Dallas area, Fort Worth, Houston, Austin, San Antonio, you know, obviously we know tech is, is, is more important in Austin than what it used to be, but it, that diversity really helps Texas weather whatever economic storms come in the future. Mm -hmm. And the foreign direct investment. I mean, I know the governor just got back from India, but uh, the number of, international companies that are setting up U.S. subsidiaries. I'm seeing that uh, increasing as well. You just came back from Brownsville on the border. Um, I mean, you're seeing that a lot of that as well? Yeah. You know, one of the things that I mentioned, no matter where I'm at and travel at, I make the point, especially I made this in Brownsville and El Paso when I was, when I was with both of those uh, communities last week, is that international trade is an extremely important piece of this state economy. And, you know, the fact is, is we export over 20% of all the value of the entire United States comes out of Texas. And we're roughly about nine, not quite 10% of the entire United States GDP, even though Texas is literally the eighth largest economy in the entire world. When I got in this job as, as controller, we were the 12th largest. And I've slowly over the years had to stop saying 12, start say 11, can't say 11, got to say 10, can't say 10, now we're nine. And then last year I had to stop saying nine because we're number number eight. And then I'm very convinced that as as the path we're going soon, we will eclipse the uh, the next largest above us. And that's the uh, country of France. I mean, that's hard to imagine that, you know, here in, in a number of years, we'll probably be the seventh largest economy in the entire world. And, and part of a, a big contributing factor to that is my point of the discussion we're talking about is international trade. That yeah. international trade is a really important piece and not just with our largest trading partner, which is Mexico or our number two, which is Canada, but literally countries all around the entire world. Well, the onshoring, the uh, the access that we have to energy, I think that's a good lead in um, to my next question, because, you know, we're the top producer of energy, of course, but we're also the top consumer of energy. Yeah. And as more manufacturing is occurring in this state and across the border, um, what have you learned about the energy plan? And tell us a little bit about your travels around the state. Yeah. So, you know, I do an industry sector tour of some issue, some industry sector every roughly six months, at least to make a deep dive, real deep dive, whether that's been manufacturing, international trade, women owned businesses, supply chain issues, cybersecurity or military establishments. I mean, we've touched all kinds of different things and water issues in the state of Texas that need to continue to grow. So we have that reliability and the one that I most recently concluded and, and we're starting to uh, put up some of our wrap ups on that tour was on the ener energy sector. And so what what we all know is Texas continues to grow. We're electricity of all things that continues to grow as we use our, you know, this technology for you and I to be able to communicate and talk to people today uh, through this venue, our phones. So there's electricity of all, all types of uses. Now, where most of the nation, even though we're using more generation needs capacity, most of the country really has been flat in their use from one year to the next. Texas historically has grown three to 5%. If you look at 2023, peak in the summer, which is usually our peak demands, our hot months. Uh, we're a very hot state in the summertime, and you have those peak days when the wind doesn't blow. Maybe the sun shines or depends on cloudy days. So the point being, we're a much more heavier mix in our generation from a, a side of it as being renewables, which mm -hmm. that's, that's an important part of the economy. It's a new part of the economy. However, when the wind doesn't blow, the sun doesn't shine, we need to have readily dispatchable energy. And I, to me, that's natural gas with, with all the uh, natural gas we have in the state. And so the point is, a couple of the wrap ups from that. One, the system is much more complex than it used to be. 
So our regulators and trying to get power from one part of the state to another part as we need it on those peak days is substantially more complex with the consumers, the users, the mix of businesses, but also the type of energy, i.e. the renewable mix. Now, that's a mix that's going to be part of it. It's going to continue to be part of it, but we need to have that readily dispatchable energy. So that's number two component. And the aging of the fleet that we have, right. it getting older. And so therefore, in the last 20 years, we don't have the new on the ground of dispatchable energy that we had prior to. And I think we really need to catch back up in that area. And last summer, we actually grew 7% in our energy use compared to 2022, a substantial jump. So the need is there. The need for more dispatchable energy, the issues of supply chains, whether it's transformers, whether it's people on the ground to be able to install the lines, connect the homes, connect the businesses, all these things are extremely important components. And I think, you know, it was important for me to get out, tour the areas, see what's going on, see what some of the constraints are, and making sure that policymakers, legislators, and what is what is the role the state of Texas can play to make sure that we're removing barriers. And we're putting opportunities in place to make sure that you and I, during those peak summer days or during those extreme cold winter days, that we have reliable, dispatchable energy in Texas, which is our, what our Texans expect. And that's what they demand. So what do you think the biggest eye opener was on this tour when you heard from the people? Yeah, so uh, really just as I was listening to industry sectors and talking to people in this field who are the experts, really for me, a couple of the catch eye openers for me more than anything else, I didn't appreciate, one, how much more complex the system is today than it used to be. From matching up the generation to you and I, the consumer, that complexity is so much more difficult to make sure that you are matching up on a day-to-day -day basis and during the intermittent pieces of the time. And, and, and usually that peak demand used to be at the, at the peak of the heat of the day, which is three o'clock. Well, really now it's more in the afternoon um, because really? not, what happens, the wind is not blowing in the afternoon. Maybe it hadn't picked up as much. The sun's going down. And so that, that, that gap of need is really a little bit in the later part of the day. Why? Because the renewable part, is is having a gap there. And and so that was an eye opening for me to see how much more complex the system is. Number two, I didn't appreciate that our fleet of readily dispatchable, whether it's natural gas, whether it's our nuclear two plants that are in Texas, which Texas can't do anything about in some in some way because it's so heavily regulated on the federal level. The time frame to get the permits is 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 so far out to be able to get those permits to expand those facilities or build nuclear facilities. And so therefore my point being is that age of our fleet is is older than what it was 20 years ago. And mm -hmm. we need to start replacing some of those fleets to make sure that we have them into the future. Okay. Well, the good news is we've got approved for some infrastructure money. We have a surplus. Right. Is that kind of your next step with this? You know, you come back from the tour, you get feedback, and now you make some decisions. Yeah, absolutely. And trying to help policymakers push them in uh, what what are some of the facts, what are some of the data, and what are some of the areas that we need to go in. And one of the things that I've talked about over and over again, whether it's the Texas economy, any economy in the past, and if you're not continuing to invest in your infrastructure, if you're not continuing to invest in those areas, whether it's water, whether it's roads, whether it's broadband infrastructure, energy infrastructure, then that economy is not going to continue to perform. And, and the area that probably concerns me more than any, and, I, and we have the ability to fill this gap with mm -hmm. both, as you mentioned, a budget surplus, as well as a constitutional amendment that was passed last year by us, the voters, to create this energy fund that the legislature put in place. So there are more tools in the toolbox now to be able to address that energy need. And so making sure that I think we've got a few more steps to go to make sure we have that reliable energy in the future, which is what's going to be important. What? Not just for the jobs that are here, but the job creation that's yet to come. So the message to the employers that are using this energy, is there, is there any, any message or takeaway, uh, you know, keep using, conserve, um, look for alternative ways to save money? 
Yeah, I think num number one, I mean, I think we've all learned and we've always known this, that if, you know, you can uh, cut the electricity off, uh, if you're not using it, then uh, you save yourself money and you're able to put back into the grid by not using power that you don't need in your home or in your business uh, when those opportunities arise. Same as if you cut the water off, you know, if it's raining outside, you probably don't need to water your yard, right? Why would you, uh, why would you waste it? And so obviously that conservation is a really important piece of the solution, regardless of what type, whether it's water or whether it's energy, but also the fact is, is you know, policymakers have recognized this is a gap that we need to make sure we fill and we are pushing in better directions to make sure we meet that need for the future. Well, I, I think what people don't realize too is that the energy in Texas is low and it, it and it's it's affordable for a reason, right? We're efficient with the energy that we have. We have an abundant resource, but as we grow and our population continues to uh, to grow year over year, yeah, we that I mean, we definitely don't want to lose that piece, right? We want to keep no, the I mean, affordability piece in place. Yeah, one of the competitive advantages we have is is price compared to other places, and that's right. one reason that we've continued to grow, and and we want to maintain that. And so you want to make sure that you have a regulatory system in place that doesn't put so many burdens on one, the generator, number two, the distributor, you and I, the consumer, whether that's individuals or businesses, that causes those prices to artificially go up. You know, right. when you do that, when government gets in the way, then you add in extra cost, and therefore, guess what? That's fewer jobs that are going to be recreated or retained because you can't afford to continue to keep the number of employees that you got. And that's a key component. That's a really key piece. And I think that's one key component that taxes continues to grow and say, for example, where do people continue to leave? I wouldn't be Texan if you didn't mention who? California. So right. therefore, the fact is the regulatory environment is a key component for that economic opportunity. Well, I think you've done a, you've done a great job of managing that because I think by going out and meeting the people on the ground, you're, you know, you're changing these, these perceptions that people have, because usually when, when, when people are looking for a quick fix, the quick fix is regulation. It is federal right, aid. Right. It is, you know, that's just, that's easy, particularly from people that are coming from states that are used to that. Yeah, well, <laughs> so I, like, I, get, I, get, I give an example in the energy space, you know, right after uh, winter storm Uri, which was a terrible winter storm. I mean, it was, you know, Texas gets blanketed by a very cold polar vortex every year. Um, but but rarely do you have the entire state of Texas is pushed, as in all 254 counties, 12 economic regions hit with a polar vortex of that magnitude where you have electrical systems go out. We don't ever want to have a repeat to that. So then some some thoughts were coming. Hey, well, let's regulate this more. Let's make sure these things are done. Let's force these companies to do A, B and C. Well, as they do that, that's a cost. And that cost is going to be pushed off to who? Yep. Me and you, the rate payer. And so the point being is we want to make sure we don't have that again. That was unacceptable. But what yep. we don't need to do is overreact to such a large degree that then cost the, the companies are putting in such overburdensome protections to ensure it doesn't happen then you and I now have added cost and we lessen the economic opportunities of Texas. There has to be a deep breath, a one, two, three count and common sense solutions. Yeah. Yeah. You got to, got to keep your eye on the ball and, um, and make the right decisions. So no, that's um, very interesting. One, we definitely want to follow you on this uh, continued Absolutely. journey. Um, I know you're a busy guy. So we've, you've got another, another uh, big project on your hands and that is broadband, the digital yes. uh, opportunity plan. I want you to talk about that. Um, yeah, you know, what we've learned, we've talked about for years, obviously, uh, that that economic opportunity is broadband, high speed Internet connectivity and not just in suburban, urban areas, but rural areas. And the fact is, especially COVID brought that front and center more than ever before, as unfortunately, businesses were having a transition to telework. Kids were going home from school that were having school from home. And all of a sudden, whether it was even doctor's appointments, you know, people couldn't even go see their physician, couldn't go see their doctor. So they were trying to do it in this mechanism of telemedicine. And so that's when really capability, the highway system of this century is the internet. And it's not just about streaming some discussion between you. It's not just about some entertainment of watching something on, on your computer screen or your TV. It literally is about education. It's about workforce. And it's also about 
having capability interaction with your with your physician for telemedicine. And then lastly, it's also an important piece. That's how people communicate with each other and a connectivity in, in their own communities at times. And so therefore, the legislature as uh, the federal government passed some, some legislation for infrastructure funding across the nation. And one component of that was $42 billion that will be distributed across the 50 states and U.S. territories for giving greater opportunities for internet connectivity. Texas receives the largest percentage of any other state in the nation, largest amount with $3.3 billion coming to Texas. We also had another half a billion dollars that came in some of the federal relief packages for broadband capability expansion in the state of Texas. And then last session, the legislature passed a new fund that you and I, the voters approved as $1.5 billion going into broadband and go, well, what, what is the need? What do we need in Texas? The fact is, is roughly you have... 3 million people, across, 3 million households across the state of Texas, you have roughly 25% of the entire state's population that doesn't have reliable high-speed internet capability in and at their home and sometimes at their businesses. And so therefore, with these different pots of funds, as the legislature was looking, who do we want to give this task to? Well, why are we talking about it? Because they gave it to Glenn Hager in the Texas Comptroller's Office. So right. we've stood up this new program as other states are trying to stand up theirs to make sure that we are now working with the internet service providers to ensure what is across the state, what are the areas that don't have the connectivity, and not just the area, but down to the household. What is the household? What is the business? And in those regions, we're going to use these dollars working with the service providers where they are building out more infrastructure and where are the barriers, whether it's the Hill Country, whether it's West Texas, East Texas. And so therefore, we're, we have the plans put together. We have published those plans. We have put the first amount of money that is out there from the $500 million that came from our federal tax dollars came back to Texas. We put that first tranche out there. And so we're working to get the next phase into place with, with business opportunities. And I really do think the game changer of economic opportunity across the state of Texas, not just in suburban, urban, but really rural Texas, now you'd be able to have somebody maintaining work in rural Texas, be able to do their job from far, and you're going to provide real economic opportunities, education opportunities, telemedicine opportunities. So it's going to be really important to make sure we connect those people across the state of Texas. And it's going to be a key component of economic opportunity for Texas. Yeah, my 254 counties, um, you know, I, I know we have a lot going on in the triangle, but there's a lot of activity happening outside of it. And, and, and migration is moving out there as well. Even people... <laughs> here that are that are living in Austin or Dallas are starting to you know do more business out in east and west texas so that's right. So now, now we're going to have new opportunities for people. This is going to be a, a multi-year program, a multi-year yep. project that we have to. There's a significant amount of needs, but you know, there's going to be make and 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 it's complicated, like most things in life. Um, the fact is, who who provides a service in that area? Making sure that we have competition. You got to make sure that your small regional internet providers have an economic opportunity, just like the big providers. And so, therefore, you know, trying to make sure that people have choice, people have opportunities. Cost effectiveness, that's going to be a key component of all of this, but I'm really proud of my team. We have stood up a program from nothing, literally stood the building up, got the doors open, worked. We went out on a listening tour across the state of Texas. Yep. We're having me continue meetings with, with industry sectors as well as communities, and so therefore an enormous amount of work has gone in to get this program up and standing, but I really think the end result is going to make a significant difference in the lives of everyday Texans, which is right. great opportunities. No, absolutely. And I mean, think how broad broadband extends to um, entertainment. Of course, you mentioned right. education, but look, I mean, you know, we've got the, you know, we have the World Cup coming here. We've got World Series, you know, got one here. Um, big, big venues are are moving into the state. And I think, uh, you know, broadband, it, it plays such a big role in our lives. I don't think we realize it, right? But yeah. as a state, if we're going to be an embracing um, these large projects and 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 entertainment venues that just that kind of plays in into it as well. And, and it get, and it gives companies, you know, in today's world, uh, the companies not everybody may be going into a particular facility. Maybe the accounting folks or the HR people or whatever group. You know, you you can actually spread your people across the state of Texas. Be more efficient. Um, you don't have to have them all live in one community, and you have to have what in common to be able to do that. Internet connectivity connectivity to the world and SAE. So that means Texas need to be connected and uh, having a 21 first, 21st century connectivity 
is going to be really important to a lot of communities in Texas. So I'm excited about it. Excited about the work the team is going through. So uh, we're we're boots on the ground and actually making this happen, which is great. No, it's uh, I, I give you again. I give you a lot of credit just communicating with people and and letting them know that we're working on it. You know, another aspect of it, which I, I you know I'd love to maybe get into it a little more with you next time is um, SH130 and you know the intelligent highway of right. the future and a lot of public and private partnerships that are um, you know stemming off of this as well. Right. That's right. There's real, there's real opportunities in a lot of different industry sectors. Yeah. Well, good. Um, last topic I wanted to discuss with you before I let you go was the, uh, the, the, the new economic development, somewhat new economic development program, Jetty. Yes. Uh, I remember you and I talking about this when uh, we were before the 88th legislative session, everyone was trying to predict what was going to happen and where it was going to go. But the, this new program that replaced chapter 313, um, how, how's it going? Tell us what you're seeing. Yeah, so, so me and my team, we've actually been working, trying to, uh, to get the program stood up. The program rules have been published. They're out. The program is stood up. It is operational. We got our first application last week. Uh, I think we got the first application in for, for the new program. Obviously this program is, is more restricted and limited, which is what the legislature wanted compared to the old chapter 313 program, which is the property tax uh, abatement program as it's called for school districts. It's a little bit different the way it operates and functions. Uh, so it's not it was so it wasn't like we just uh, turned the page of the chapter of the same book. We have a completely different book because it is a completely different program, same concept, but much more limited in scope. However, with that being said, the legislature wanted to be more specifically tailored uh, than what we had before. And so we uh, essentially had to start from scratch, stand up a new program. It stood up. We got our first application in the door, and, and I expect we'll continue to have more as the program now is stood up and operational. Okay, great. Well, we'll we'll definitely keep uh, apprised of some of the projects that are coming through uh, through that. Anything in closing? I mean, that you know, you're responsible for a lot of things, and of course, the uh, the budget and the surplus. I know the state revenue outlook is good. Um, anything you want to tell us in closing about the financial? Yeah, I would just I would just say kind of kind of in closing. You know, the fact is the economy, thankfully, has continued to outperform our expectations. While consumer spending had started to slow down last year, uh, business spending has slowed down a little bit, which is not necessarily anything that we didn't anticipate. Uh, it's it's really tracking along with what we kind of anticipated and told the legislature. Uh, with that being said, despite the fact that the legislature last session made a significant commitment for property tax reduction, as well as several constitutional amendments, some of them that we talked about, which funded water, park systems, university systems, energy, all types of different infrastructure, which is really critical with that once in a lifetime economic uh, boost that we had of a, of a budget surplus. We're still looking at next legislative session after we end this two-year budget that the legislature still in what's called general revenue, which is our ordinary tax revenues coming in and out of the treasury. Uh, the fact is we're still looking at probably somewhere around a $17 billion surplus. I mean, that is phenomenal. Uh, when you compare again, wouldn't be Texas if I didn't mention California, is completely the opposite. Um, they are in the hole. They are in a deficit and we're in a surplus. And then that doesn't include what's called our Economic Rainy Day Fund, Economic Stabilization Fund, or Rainy Day Fund, which is the state savings account, uh, which is a higher threshold for the legislature to be able to take money out of it and use it for any specific purpose. Um, but but that fund right now has about 19 plus billion dollars in it. And we expect in two years from now, when we close this current two-year budget, that mm -hmm. fund will have somewhere around 24, 25 billion dollars. So we are completely the antithesis, the opposite of the West Coast. It shows we're moving in the right direction. And it also means the legislature has opportunities next session, as long as the global economy continues to perform. You know, the, the big talk is we, we may be able to avoid uh, a recession here in the United States, uh, you know, in federal policy. I do think that opportunity looks brighter than what it did before. Um, mm -hmm. Tax, regardless, is going to outpace the national average in the economic growth. And so, therefore, my point being is the legislature next session, they still, while they don't have the record surplus they did of last year, they still are in really good shape. And the finances of Texas are in order and we are moving in the right direction. Well, you know, and I, I, I know it's it, it sounds I think it means a lot when you compare what what the situation California is in and the, the situation we are in. And, and right. you had just mentioned it. I mean, it's all about the future. How do you prepare yourself for the future? And I mean, look, when you're in a hole like that, 
you've got to make decisions that you might, wouldn't normally make because you're in such a bad financial condition. And I don't know what they're going to do to get themselves out of it. But when you look at the disparity between the two states, it's only going to get wider. That's right. And, and you know what? One of the things I continue to make to the legislature is the dollars that we have, obviously, you return some of them back to the taxpayers as taxpayer dollars, but you also try to invest in infrastructure. And you also continue to prepare for that true rainy day. And that true rainy day, it means that at some point in time, the national, the global economy will have a recession. We don't know when. We don't know why. But the fact is, Texas will be impacted that by that, and we need to be prepared for when that day comes. And so that also means you prepare just like a squirrel in the winter. We'll put some some nuts away in, in, the, in the little kitty there to the side, and we've done that. And that is prudent like you and I do in our own households. We try to prepare that. for that unexpected expense, that car repair, that home repair. That's how you pay for that. You don't have to borrow money on the blank check because guess what texas we're not like dc we don't have deficit spending and we're and we're in a good place because of that we have to balance our books and so therefore make sure taxpayers get some relief you fund infrastructure and you also save some for what the unknown that's coming in the economic future one yeah. day well and that that's that's why we created it right we had uh we had a situation where we didn't have a rainy day fund. That's right. That's right. And, and um, in the meantime, you make sure that you try to continue to have lower regulations and make sure that you give economic opportunities to business to create jobs, because that's why people are moving to Texas. You know why? Economic opportunities. Exactly. No, look, uh, uh, we really appreciate your time. I, I know Absolutely. I talked to Chris about maybe having your office uh, stay in touch with us on a frequent basis. Yeah, yeah can do that. Yeah, you know, yeah. We'll try to find a way to, to, to have conversations and continue to stay in touch. No, that's great. Um, we appreciate it. Yeah, man. And, uh, we'll talk to you, you soon. Sounds good. Thanks. All right. Okay. Adios. Controller. Thank you.